have an Excel file like measuring by lead source and having like anticipated cost per acquisition and LTV and then measuring it that way. I was I just knew I was spending Which five, Cantu has, by the way, if anybody wants yeah, it. Cantu has everything <laughs> process wise. I learned a lot about process from him going to his call center. Um, so to answer your question about Facebook, really about leads in general, it was a necessity. So this is what I want to share with you guys. In your business, nobody here has done one. Nobody's, um, Winston Churchill said something like, you know, a battle plan is only good till the first shot is fired. So here's the truth. You do need to critically think about a plan. You need to have, you know, a plan, but you're going to run up against walls. And I think grit and your ability to maneuver around those object, uh, obstacles is really what makes people successful. And I don't know if you're born with that. I don't know if it's taught. Maybe it's a combination. So to answer your question, I w when I first got in the business, you know, I, I sold at Transact for three years as an LOA agent, which don't hate on LOAs because to me, I had to do something 10,000 hours be before I became an expert at it. And I got to make $150,000 a year becoming an expert at it. So thank you, Transact, and and and, and you still have a really good relationship. With great, Sanders. great relationship. So I actually had a pretty big business deal later on with them for a yes. little bit that helped you scale, right? It did. So, yep. So, um, so, so when I I started my agency after that, I worked with Hell Plan One, and I was purchasing leads from them. Okay, and that's another great company. Bill and Tom are awesome guys, but I was only I was exclusively purchasing leads from them. Well they were sending us leads and our team was converting them higher than them. So like, Hey, why don't you come train some of our agents? So I would go and train their agents. Well, then their agents got better. So they would stop selling me as many leads and they would keep them. Yeah. So <laughs> then I'm like, all right, so what am I going to do now? Cause so help plan, like that's the only place I bought leads. So then I tried like some lead exchanges and was figuring that out. And then the Facebook wave came. So then to answer your question, bro, it wasn't like this thought out plan of like, hmm, my CPAs are beating. It was, I've got to generate leads. Yeah. So, so, okay. So you're, you're buying leads, you get LOAs in your house, you're, you got to feed them. They stop selling you leads because you train their agents to be too good. Cause the only reason a, a brokerage or a, a call center is going to sell you leads is because they got more than they can close. But when you make their agents close they them, hire more. they're going to make more closing them. Hey, that's the sign of a good lead, by the way. One, someone won't sell you if they can close it themselves because they know it's valuable. Um, but when you are, so if, I'm going to caveat there. People ask me so often where to buy leads. <sighs> Typically, the people that are selling the highest quality leads are not going to sell to you because you can't buy them in a dispositionable way or in a quantity enough, like Jagger sells leads and he's probably got one or two people he sells them all to, right? Like he's not gonna go out and be like, sure, do you wanna buy some leads? Do you wanna buy? They're too expensive, they're too hard to generate. It just doesn't make sense. No, but there is a benefit, because I was doing the same thing. There is a benefit of having those two large partners that you can offload your leads to because when, so when Facebook dried up, I taught myself Google and Bing and actually Jagger helped me with that as well. Um, and, um, and by helping, like there's like, we're all really good friends, but when it comes to leads, there's some guarding there. So it's not like we got to sit down together and say, let's figure out Google together. It was just like, hey, what's your CPL on Google right now? Oh, that dude's beating me. I got to figure that out, right? Like yeah. that's those Yeah, when I, when I get to call one of these guys, you, and this, just know that, like if you, if, if you grab the ear of somebody that is doing something really well, like they'll share, but it's in like small amounts. So like I'll ask small things, like, like that, like what's like your you what's your cost lead forms from me on Facebook? You told me I didn't ask him that. I said I'm doing really well on I'm doing really well on Facebook. I didn't know how the scale he was doing it at at the time. I had I actually had seen you on YouTube prior to that. I didn't even know you were doing Facebook ads. No, but then you but somebody else had told me I think at that event, and then you said, "Yeah, lead forms changed everything." And I was like, "I'm not even using lead forms." So that at lead ads. Event? It wasn't Galen. It's Galen's we fault. Cool with, who's that really good-looking agent that goes to your events? What's his name? Cameron. Cameron. He's too pretty. I don't like hanging out with yeah, him. Yeah, that's why we. That's why we don't go yeah. anymore. He's too pretty. I do remember that. Yeah. So to answer your question, I just taught myself out of necessity, right? So yeah. then, um, you know, but then yeah. So you teach yourself Facebook, and then Facebook's ROIs now aren't as good. The margins are slim. It's oversaturated. There's still a place for Facebook, but. It's not what it, like an exclusive source for us or for people. Right. Like There's, there, are, there are niches in Facebook, I think, right now that are doing better. There was a point, and I'll just you know, tell you guys this because I don't have it scripted in, but from my perspective early on with Facebook, like an ad didn't even say sponsored. So I started, I actually did it different than you, I think. I don't, 
were you running as Medicare? You were running as Senior Healthcare Direct. Yep. So I started running mine as Justin Brock, the page. And then I would run an ad where it just looked like a viral post from a guy named Justin Brock because it didn't say sponsored. It didn't look like an ad. And back then it was earlier in the advertising days. So the, the response rate to an ad on social media was different because people weren't used to being advertised to on there. So they just thought everything was a viral post. Um, and so I used post engagement ads early on where I would just put, I, actually one of my most successful ones was talking about back when Manhattan Life BVH would pay on actual charges. I did a blurb about that and it generated so much like, t like low cost inbound calls because I put the phone number in it. Literally just something that simple at the time. My phone was ringing off the hook but they call about dental and then a lot that, but I was targeting people of 64. So I was writing a whole bunch of open enrollment med subs off of it. Um, now that well dried up really quick, like that's not a thing. Don't go do that. It won't work. I promise. Uh, don't and don't advertise actual charges uh, on Manhattan Life because it's not there anymore. So, but if you, you yeah, know, but the, the point was problem. though, like we, it's not like that. I came into the business and then threw up one ad and it worked. There was a bunch of crap that didn't work, and then that worked, and it worked for a short amount of time. But it had stopped kind of working to that to that level. And then you told me lead ads, and then lead ads did work really well for me. For a bit, but it's the same thing. I mean, you yeah. know, you the spend so much money, you dried the well up. The main thing is, like, like you tested whatever you said, the TV thing, 240 grand. You just threw it away. Seven, that's a horrible CPA. I know, it was <laughs> awful. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, what's you, your CPA, you Justin? It. Uh, it's $11,473. No, but you tried it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's like, you know, and, and you guys, you know, whether you're large or small, you have to try things. Like, try a direct mail campaign, try this or that. And then, and then sometimes something works and then it doesn't work. And then you got to, like, pivot to something else. Yeah. And, you, and everybody that has uh, that that's somebody that you see in the industry is doing really, really well has some sort of moment where they they had a big win, but they didn't have a big win accidentally. They tried a bunch of things and they put a lot of work into it and they stayed up till two in the morning reading about something, all that you know. So um, how but how quickly I still oh, it was no like, Facebook ads eight seven million bucks a year. Like what's what is that timeline? I mean I I learned Facebook in like a month. So, but so you were spending ten, fifteen, twenty thousand a month in a month or two, yeah. but you had to have the leads. Yeah. So you were well, less. Then I started selling the leads. That's what I was saying. When you have an outlet for the leads, because with digital yeah. marketing, none none of the systems like when you pause them. Right. So if you can keep them running, right. But if they're good leads and you only have 12, 15 agents, then your agents are on the phones. So then you ha you so, sell your overflow, so you keep the digital stuff on. So think about you know, when you're thinking about these platforms like Facebook and Google. It's algorithm. They have an algorithm, and and they're and they're getting smarter and smarter and smarter all the time. So he just said something. Some of you will run a Facebook ad, and you'll be like, "I got enough leads, or I'm going on vacation, or I'm doing this, I'm gonna to toggle it off." That goes into the algorithm, and then tells Facebook, "This person toggled you off this date," and it's like a strike against you almost. And there's a point where if you're toggling it on and off too much, you're not running consistent ads under that account then they think, hey, this guy's not going to spend enough money. We're, we're not going to reward him at the same rate that we would others. With Google, it's a little bit of a difference. If you look at an SEO algorithm, and we're by no means the, uh, the, the forefront of this. We're trying very, very hard, and we're doing better and better. But they care about the end user a lot. So the result for the end user on Google is very important. So that is part of their algorithm. If you're providing a poor result, you game it, you get to the top, and then it's clear that you're at the top for a bad reason, they're going to learn that really quick and they're going to put you not at the top. They're going to take you off the, the first or second page or wherever you're at, right? So but I think I cut you off when you were talking about, so just to finish up probably the lead conversation is, you were talking about like people ask you like, I'm paying five bucks for a lead or $10 a lead. So again, just to, for those of you that are following along, it doesn't matter how much a lead costs. It matters your spend divided by your sales. And then what are you evaluating your sale at? So if you have a $10 lead that's converting or, you know, really bad, like, you know, 1%, well, let's just make it easy. If you have a $10 lead converting at 5%, you know, well, okay, I'm trying to give you math. We're not mathematicians, no. guys. We used a calculator on all of this stuff. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but you're, but, but the plus you, everybody goes out, these events, everybody goes out drinking and then you start at 8 a.m. <laughs> Like if I ever did, I started at nine thirty, and I gave everybody a really relaxed first day. But you weren't. You got in late. The point is, okay, if you a, didn't benefit. He didn't benefit from yesterday. Dollar lead converts at hundred percent, and a ten dollar lead converts 
at 1%, whatever the math is, just divide your spend by your sales, and that's better. It doesn't yeah. matter the CPI. Yeah, so, so a lot of times people will go for a really low, low quality lead, a super low closing ratio, and, and I always think they're not really even factoring in the time that they have to pay an agent or their own time to even work that lead, Well, there's too. two parts of a CPA. You have your media spend, and then you have your, your agent cost. Right. So if you're by yourself and you're just buying cheap leads and dialing, that's one thing, but as you have an agency, if you have your agent costs, and if your agent costs, well, uh, if your media, if you're dialing cheap shit, then your agents are not talking to people and selling people. So then even if your media CPA is really good, your agents fixed costs are going to be really high. So you have to try to find that balance of keeping the agents consistently selling. Cause when you're actually doing your whole CPA, you divide all your costs by all of your sales. And so to your point, if somebody's, if you have a say 10 agents dialing a bunch of crappy leads, you're like, yeah, but my CPA is a hundred dollars. But with 10 agents, when you should be getting, say, 100 sales a week, you're getting 40 sales a week. There's a whole other component to that that's weighing down your actual profitability. And if you use one of those like lifetime value spreadsheets, and there's one that's decent if you look at MedicareLTV.com that IFG put together recently. Well, it will, Shameless plug. It will, yeah, I, they're very good partners of ours. They're a premier sponsor, a platinum sponsor. So oh, I, I thought you made it. No, I didn't make it. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't make it. I was hitting on I didn't, I didn't make it. Uh, but MedicareLTV.com is a cool little calculator that shows you the compounding MedSup Medicare Advantage. Uh, and they, they use kind of an industry average LTV on them. But um, they also uh, calculate persistency in there. And so to your credit on the big the support team, if you look at the persistency toggle on there, if you change it from 80% to 60%, you think about it, 20% compounding over five years, you're, you're actually about half what your residual income yeah. would have been of that time. I haven't seen that form. My issue that I'm fighting right now with LTV is I think it's tied to the lead source to an extent. It absolutely is. because yeah. we That's what we were talking about earlier. And you, when you said that, I didn't know where you're getting at, but it's tied to your lead source. And there's a lot of this, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it. I throw it all over the internet. Anyway, the Pakistani fronted, uh, not to not, hate on you Pakistan, said it with me on but stage one. Indi Indians <laughs> and the Indian and Pakistani and call centers, call call centers, centers are doing a really bad job at creating a quality. My, my, I, I disagree with that statement. I, 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 don't, I disagree I've, with your statement. I don't think they're doing a poor job. I think the people well, they're doing a good job. The leads. The, so I just I, I think it's it's like. But you have a really high, um, a really, a really from what you're telling me on yours, the persistency is higher than I would have imagined. For yeah, sure. because again, and I'm buying the same leads. It's just I'm nurturing that customer better. Yeah, that's on the agent. Like, people blame external factors. Like, you know, I think we're talking about private equity, right? Like, is that good or bad for the industry? Like, first of all, it's part of the industry. So, well, what the, are you, and I, I'm wondering the same. So, my thoughts on some of those lead, the lead flow was the person that answers the phone call that then says, "Sure, transfer me." On some of the phone calls I've heard, is a, the prospect that would say that to the next person that calls. And so then there's internal churn. No, so, well, you're, so to your point, it's part of nurturing. But I, I do believe what's part of what you said, that lead generation tactic has an impact on the LTV, opposed to a somebody who replies to a Facebook or YouTube ad of Justin Brock talking about insurance and then calling your agency. Mm -hmm. Because to your point, if somebody got called and they were being willing to be transferred, your theory is they're going to be willing to be transferred again. Yeah. I counter that with if you do enough on nurturing that customer, then you tell that customer you never need to do that again. You call us. That's what Johnny says. My brother, dude, you, you got to give a shout out to my brother, say, Johnny. You're not even the best Brock. No, I'm not even the best insurance. Brock agent anymore. So, but John, Johnny tells him that you're he's not even the, the second best because I've met your dad. No, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. Uh, but Johnny. You know, he tells him he's the best agent. <laughs> he's real by best. He's the best agent, and he he tells them right away after the sales buttoned up that you know they never need to answer any of those phone calls. So like we have, you know, we, have a, we have a script that is called buttoning up the sale. Yeah. If you're not buttoning up the sale, that's going to have an impact down the road. So you got to set clear expectations after you sell somebody. Do you put so when I first came into the business, we were I was going broke. I was broker or I was uh, you know field agent side, right? And one of the hard lessons I learned from getting burned by some experienced agents right out of the gate was going out and and rewriting med subs and not preparing them for what the yep. other agent yep. would so say. You, so so we actually started to you. So what he's talking about is, and this happens a lot, is you know, if you the testability period, that kind of stuff. So if you rewrite somebody else's cut, sorry I interrupt you, but I'm no, not you're, that sorry, but they um go for it. So like if you rewrite somebody, like if you, especially in phone sales or even in face-to-face -face sales, 
if you're taking somebody off of a med sup, well, they have an agent of record. That agent of record gets the communication that that person canceled their sup. And they have 30 days where they're automatically approved to go back and get that same sup. So if you sell someone like that, you need to set that expectation of, you know, you're going to, you might get a phone call from your, your, your former broker. Now, if he calls you, I say we, 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 are, we should be honest with him. You didn't do your job looking out for me and somebody else did. So I have a new agent. Thank you. Have a good day. Like set that expectation. That's pretty and good. And then we go back and say, you'll never have Sounds to. like something Johnny would say. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah don't. We, would, we would try to, so I would always would, would prepare him for the specific rebuttals they'd have. And one of them that got burned, burned me was uh, the contestability period where they come back and start talking about there's a two-year contestability period. And on the current stuff that you're on, you're not past that. You're, you're already past that contestability period. So I'd say they're going to tell you things like you're past your contestability. But see, we're expert underwriters. We already know that we've underwritten you appropriately. We don't have policy rescissions and things like that happening. So really, he's just trying to get you to pay more so that he continues to get his renewal. So we still stick it back to the other agent yeah. a little bit. But we use some of that substantive. But it, it, I mean, I don't know how many of you need that. Some of you don't. But it's very important because when you go out and you find you, especially when you're starting or you're younger and you're writing a MedSup or a Medicare Advantage plan or any of that, and somebody comes back and just flips it back, like uh, that hurts real bad early on. Yeah. So, and it hurts real bad when you're spending eight million a year on Facebook and people are, are burning your CPAs up, so or your lifetime values up. So, so on the um, the LTV side, how do you calculate your lifetime value when you haven't? experienced like so you say so you're two years in the business right and you you're estimating a five or six year renewal um, on average and you're, you're doing your commission math that's parts easy but how do you estimate how long you're taking them before you have the experience to know how long you can keep them? so a couple things one queen of the bundle would tell you sell more increase your LTV that's true. <laughs> she does say people don't talk about increasing their LTV enough by increasing LTV by selling ancillary products to them and also, if they have more than one policy with you, they're more likely to stay with you too, yeah. which will help your LTV. So the, all those are true things. Um, for Medicare Advantage, and this is where I'm particularly watching, is like Go Health and eHealth. You know, they report what their LTV is on on MA. Primarily, I mean, they primarily write MA. But you know, again, I still like I have ours as higher because I think we, you know, I think we do a better job of retaining them, um, and, and the, uh, based on lead source. So if you're starting out, I mean. I would credit a med sup. I always credit at twelve hundred dollars when I first did it, but like now med subs are probably worth fifteen hundred in my like. But I would still be conservative because you can also trick yourself in spending more money and, and reducing your margin and to make yourself feel better. So, you know, the reality is the average med sub commission is three hundred bucks a year. The average customer is going to keep it three and a half, four years, even if you do nothing. So, like, I think if you use four years of commission, that was always my logic. You know, I was, I've proven to be wrong. Like they're worth more than that, but I still ran my business at that 1200. So I, yeah. that's what I always did. Um, and then on MA, again, depending how you're generating it and your level, you know, we, we currently use a, we, we currently use about a thousand dollars for an MA is what we use for LTV. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when I'm looking at it, I, I calculate it higher, but I, I do a very hyper local, you know, high saturation thing, but it's, it's completely different, you know, but we do really well in service as well. So, um, but it's a lot of you don't get what he's saying though. Like if you're looking at a $1,500 CPA or t even a 1200 LTV or yeah, LTV, then what can your CPA be? Like, what is your margin want to be? And so some people say, Oh, it's going to take several years to get that money. Yeah. But you know, it's coming. So if you know that's coming, how do you invest for that? So if you're trying to acquire a client at, you know, $83, uh, you're not going to be you're able to compete scared. with a guy that, it's like, well, I'll spend 500 or I'll spend 300 or I'll spend How many 400. people here would spend 600 to make 1200 Every single one of us, right? I think I've done that before. Like, yeah. Now, your obstacle is where do I get the cash flow? That's the obstacle, right? You know, so there's, I mean, there's different ways to do it. If you're like me, your house values are through the roof. Well, go borrow it at 3% on HELOC and go add some policies. Yeah. I took, I cashed out. Don't, uh, that's not financial advice. Where's my, um, well, early on, I, I cashed out my, I can't, I my cashed point is out like, my or, or, go, to do it. or go get an equity partner or go, um, you know, you know, do something to raise that money is my point. My Edward Jones guy was, you know, telling to tell me I should have took out a, a HELOC instead of cashing out my TSP, but I felt like the TSP was just easy, low hanging fruit to grab, even though I had all these penalties. 
when I did it, but I it was when I had found Facebook was working and I, I only had like 30 grand in there, but I was like, I gotta dump this 30 grand in. Well, for this. me, I sold 20% of my business yeah. uh, early on. You know, I, I, so I, I had about 150,000 when I left Transact to invest in the business and payroll was due Friday and I didn't have enough money <laughs> and it was Wednesday. And I was supposed to do a loan with uh, Mutual of Omaha to get the money. Uh, Cause I had about 2000 policies at the time, which is worth about a million bucks, right? Roughly. So I was like, I'll go get a loan for, you know, a few hundred thousand and it, it was going to get approved. Um, but then it failed QC cause they said, cause more than 50% of my block was actually Mutual of Omaha. So they said it was a conflict of interest. Mm. So I found out that Wednesday evening that the deal, I wasn't going to get it. So again, and everybody has stories like this that is successful. And a lot of you guys have these too. Like it is really, really, really hard to be an entrepreneur. Like it is really, really, really hard. I mean, hospital for chest pain multiple times, fights with your spouse because you're not home. Chronic migraines. Chronic migraines. Um, this you, guy's like, me and him have like identical migraine issues. And he's went and got, he's getting like the injection, the Cephle device, the <laughs> prescription. He's got, he's got it all, the nasal spray. I told, I told my neurologist, there's not an amount of money I wouldn't pay to get rid of my migraines. Oh, no, 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 there you go. But, but that's, Work stress, right? Probably. So, I mean, that's a contributor and I'm addicted to this stuff, so I won't stop. Right. Um, but like, it's all really hard. I mean, it's not easy. So like, I look at these young guys, man, I'm like, and, and, and anybody like, it's like, you know, it's really, really hard, but it's worth it. But like none of us, everybody has stories where they had to go do something to raise money or they got in a fight with a business partner and they had to figure that out or, you know, they messed up, you know, and they failed, but then they got like, they got back up and figured it out. Like you're, it's not this pretty story of like, I'm going to come up with a 10 year plan with uh, yeah. an exit point right here. It's going to go like that. It just, I mean, unless somebody can stand up here and tell you they, that they did that, I haven't seen it. One of, one of my downline agents who's having a really good successful, um, you know, first year and, and it has tremendous potential. I keep having to tell him that cause it's hard, but he came to me originally and he'll know who he is in here, but he came to me with like a, you know, like the most thought out business plan ever. And I'm I, details, budgets, everything. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, you're way smarter than me, first of all. This is very impressive. Um, but I was worried that he was too detail-oriented and, and, or, or would, would, uh, would set an unrealistic expectation of the, the early days. Um, and he'll tell you now, like, that business plan kind of fall, fell by the wayside. But he actually did really well. I mean, he's doing very well. He's going to have yeah, a bright well, future. If, but the, if he's but that the, prepared. But in that, and so, actually, it, I don't, just so you guys know, like, I don't go after typically a brand-new agent. Um, we, we do want them, we want our organize, organization to be able to help more and more new agents. But normally when they try to reach out to me, I try to refer them or, or do something. We always want to help them some way. But he came to me with a Loom video and like a, a, a super well thought out business plan, Excel spreadsheets, all that. And even though he was brand new, but I was like, man, he's really put so much thought, in, thought into it. And so I was like, so I started, I kind of fought for him a little bit. And he was, he was, he was actually interviewing different FMOs um, and we got him. But he's done really well. But it wasn't that I thought his business plan was good. It was that I was like, "Wow, this guy puts he's some to do energy this. into He'll this." Figure out. Yeah, and he's a smart guy. So, um, and it, and it's it's paying off, and it'll pay off bigger. He's he's a great guy. But anyway, look, Bob, we got to wrap it up. But anybody's going to be rapid fire questions. Rapid fire question, like, let's see here. Since you prepared really hard for this interview. <sighs> This is the least prepared one I had because I knew it would go well. I think it's going well. Did it go well? Okay. Um, really, you know, I, I, you made a point earlier, and I want you to close on, on this, this topic. On objections? Can I do that one, please? <sighs> that was not what I was going to say. i get people stuff. They can, Damn it. What were you going to say? Uh, sh fine. What go over objections. Point it to me. Okay, I'll tell you that. I was, I was going to say that, you know, we have a lot of conversations about private equity, oh. publicly traded companies, um, you know, different strategies that are, some people will say are not good for the industry, bad for the industry, whatever. And I, I'll say, uh, I can't remember who it was, but you, you alluded to it as well. So I don't know if he said it to you, but there's somebody else who said this, but it's not any of those things that are bad. It's people misusing them. I think even Cantu had um, said, you know, it's one of the things that's bad in the industry right now is getting into the business with the intention of rapid scale, no service, exit in three years. Like, and so they don't really care about building a quality business. 
but you had said this too that um, you know exit strategy is very important, but you know good people and bad you know good people and bad people exist in in every industry, and somebody doing something at the expense of an industry can happen, and that we're seeing some of that. So and sometimes they we see people start to demonize private equity or you know these publicly traded companies for doing it, but it's not necessarily those those things in existence. It's somebody misutilizing that avenue. Um, I don't yes. know if you wanted to comment on exit strategy and private equity and, and your a lot of the stuff you said. So real, so, and that kind of goes with heaping comps, right? So, all right. So in my my perspective is when telephonic sales first came out, a lot of us that are in the room now, we were actually kind of villainized on somebody's top trips because there was one way of doing the business, and because there's something new, which is a disruptor, which businesses face, dis industries face disruptors all the time. Okay, not all disruptors are, are good or bad. They're just disrupting the status quo of how things have always been done, right? Right. Well, telephonic sales was considered bad. Like, oh, that's a bad disruptor. You guys, you guys can't do as good of a job as I can. You guys aren't going to care about the customer, all that stuff, which is completely not true. Like, I, I know we've done a great job. I know Blue Red Benefits does a great job. Go Medigap, Elite, you guys, we do a great job over the phone. So I compare that with private equity. Like, to me, true, when, you ha when you're owned by private equity, there, there is a struggle between the short-term objectives and the long-term business goals. But as long as it's the right person that's that they purchased, you can maneuver that and still run a great business. So, and the other thing is whether it's good or bad to me, it's like it doesn't matter. It's here. Yeah, yeah. Like so, I mean, like it ain't going anywhere. Right. So, <laughs> you know, if you see that opportunity, right, like it's all about EBITDA. So yeah, you could grow your business, but that doesn't mean you're growing it the wrong way. It just might mean that you're doing everything the same, but you might heat model so you get your EBITDA higher, so you make more money. Right. That doesn't mean you're running a bad business. So. Yeah, I think it's there. And then I'll close with this before Tony comes and beats me up. Um, so overcoming objection, I just wanted to kind of give you guys like a sales thing. And I know my Medicare Monsters group, we gave this out to them. And I think it was helpful for everybody there. So I used to think that I was really, really good at overcoming objections because I'm really, really smart and I'm really good at sales. But as I've hired more and more agents and I've listened to more and more calls, you know, I used to think like what I said to overcome that objection was why I was so good at sales. And I was humbled by listening to agents who aren't that good at sales and following a process they can still overcome objections. So here's a process that we used that we've scaled to overcome objections. It's three-step process. You, you know, you agree with them. So, cause everybody wants to feel heard when they have an objection. So you agree like, you know, well, I need to think about it. Oh, I understand Mrs. Smith. You need to think about it. Right. And then you have the, but, and this is your rebuttal. So the second part is you have to have a logical response. Okay. And I used to think this was the most important. Th I thought this is why I was really good. Right. But really, it's the third step that makes somebody great at sales, and it's they keep going. They don't wait for that person to receive that rebuttal and accept it. They keep going. So how many phone calls did you listen to where somebody, that somebody's number two, their logical response was like, that wasn't very good, but they kept going, and they an still agent. sold it? I have an agent. God bless them. <laughs> and I'll just give you an example. Well, I need to talk to my daughter. Oh, I totally understand you got to talk to your daughter. You know, I played soccer growing up. Hey, go grab your Medicare card <laughs> and let's get this done. Like, I, it's, I mean, it wasn't that absurd, but it wasn't far. So, so Bob said, we, we were in Monsters. He, he said this, and the, I think at the time you gave the, the similar lessons like that. And I said, uh, or, but you said, it doesn't matter what your objection is as much as it matters that you just, or your rebuttal, as much as it just matters that you have one and you keep going. Yep. And, um, that's one of the things I say, like uh, Johnny and Holt and some of our team, was we talk about that, do really well. I wouldn't say that they have like the exact perfect response. It's just that they keep going. But it is that keep going part, I promise. not letting them really think about it. They're thinking they're like, I guess I got to get my card while I'm trying to figure out why he's talking about his soccer career. You know, I'm serious. Um, so that's why I just leave you guys. I just want to leave you guys with that. Like as you're scaling or as you're selling, like you know, hear their concern. Give, has, you know, hopefully you're smart enough to come up with a logical response. It just has to be logical. It doesn't have to be great. But the key step is just keep going. Like act like, just like, nope, we're going to keep going. Let's get to the app and get it done. So, and we're going to keep on going right now, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Medicare Bob, ladies and gentlemen.